Again, this is our presentation continuing on Swanee County's history, our Lunch and Learn series, which may or may not be at lunchtime apparently for everybody, uh, but it is on Swanee County's history. And a couple months ago, I mentioned to you that we had started uh, talking about the early 1900s. Now, I had been trying to go decade by decade, but there's just so much between 1900 and 1920 that I just made it three different presentations. So we're gonna hit mainly the latter part of that era, like 1915 to 1920, but I do have several things going back earlier. Next time I go through this series, I'll try to put it more chronological order, but sometimes it just makes sense to talk about topics together. So, with that being said, here is a map from 1916. It was the last map I showed you at last month's presentation, but it shows Swanee County as it was in 1916. As we've been looking the last few months, you've noticed that there are more and more communities that are disappearing. Vehicles are now more in use. Uh, you've got more train traffic. People can travel by train. And so there is no longer this need to have communities every three to five miles, uh, a place you can walk to or take your mule or your horse to, because you've got automobiles. And so those small communities are starting to dry up. And uh, this shows the major railroads, and also the major communities still. And I'll show this map once or twice later on in this presentation also uh, to talk about different parts of it. But you've got places, of course, like Live Oak and Brantford, O'Brien, McAlpin, um, down the park is that over here out of pocket, basically can't see it, uh, but in Welburn. So those places still exist today, but then you've still got several other communities, places like Stokely, Emerson, uh, even Wilmarth is showing on there, uh, places like that that don't exist anymore. And you'll see as time goes by, as we go through this series, you'll see less and less communities popping up on our maps. It's just that's part of the time. People were moving into the big cities, places like Live Oak. Now, again, this map's from 1916, but I'm going to go back a few years and talk about a railroad I did not talk about last month, and that is the Swanee River and White Springs Railway. It was chartered in 1909. Some of the folks who chartered it was uh, W.L. Tedder, who was president, C.H. Tedder, which Chapman, I believe, was his nickname, Chapman Tedder, uh, H.E. Barkus, W.W. Pennington, C.D. Blackwell, and H.H. Brown. A lot of these guys, most of these guys were from Swanee County, and they were big wigs, in especially the Live Oak, the Blackwells, uh, the Penningtons, the Tedders, very big in Live Oak and Swanee County's uh, business section. So these guys established the railroad with a capital of $100,000. And their point is basically, uh, the purpose of this railroad is to, to carry passengers and a little bit of cargo from Live Oak up to White Springs. And it discusses that up in here. So basically they're trying to go from Live Oak to White Springs, a direct railroad route. Now then, that railroad shows up on this map here. You can see coming from Live Oak, going uh, northeast towards White Springs up here. So that is at least the plan route of the railroad, and that is what they're doing. In 1910, though, it shows that there was only 4.5 miles of track that had been put down. So that's a lot more than four and a half miles. So they had not quite made it to White Springs. They had a total value of about $9,000 for those tracks, plus $5,000 in rolling stock. So even though they were not going from Live Oak to White Springs, they still had stuff that they were using traffic. A lot of timber and that kind of stuff probably at this point. Now, the, the Swanee River White Springs Railway, although it was chartered in 1909, it only lasted about three years. It was one of those things that, that just died off. And we've talked about railroads <coughs> over, the, over the months of this presentation that a lot of people had a lot of grandiose ideas for putting in a railroad and going, you know, 100 miles away. And they maybe got five or 10 and then either ran out of money or uh, the market changed, things like that. And this is one of those things that happened with this railway. They don't show up on state reports after 1912. They're just, they're not there. But anyway, this is what they had planned on doing, was going from Live Oak to White Springs. And part of that has to deal with uh, White Springs at that time was one of the communities that had a lot of hotels. They had Sulphur Springs there, plus Swanee Springs had its at Sulphur uh, Hotels. And that it was this time where scientists were realizing, you know what, that sulfur doesn't have the cure-all that people thought it did. So a lot of folks are no longer coming to Swanee County and Hamilton County in this case, 
so there's not as much of a need to bring in all those passengers in those railroads. So, moving on, Richard W. Sears. You may have heard of this guy. Sears and Roebuck. Please tell me. Yes, no I remember as a kid getting to flip through the book for the Christmas stuff. You know, that thick and a lot of stuff that my parents couldn't afford, but it was nice to look at it. But um, Sears and Roebuck, of course, the last 100, 150 years had a lot of a lot of things that they have sold, including houses. Um, what he did, Richard Sears, did was bought a lot of cutover timberland in Suwannee County. Basically, the various sawmills that we had, the Dowlings and, and many other sawmills, had, had cut the timber off the property, left pretty much vacant land. And so he sees a business opportunity. And so he interacts with uh, Thomas Dowling, especially. So in 1910, he buys up a lot of the property that Mr. Dowling and his family and his company owned, and he decides to sell them off through his catalog, basically. I mean, hey, you want to buy some you know, toys, buy some houses, here's some property to put that house on. And so he did that. He bought it up. He also bought up uh, the remaining timber and uh, lumber mills that Mr. Dowling had, <coughs> or, excuse me, and decided to go into business here in Suwannee County. So those cut out timberlands that he was selling off, he formed another company called the Suwannee River Land Belt Company. And that went for many decades, selling tens of thousands of acres in, in just Suwannee County. Originally, it was going for 26 cents an acre. I could afford a few acres that way. 26 cents an acre. And again, it'd be the Sears catalog, and also by all those railroad agents that he was familiar with. And the Swan River Land Belt Company dissolved in 1965. But until that point, they had sold over or about 10,000 sales, 100,000 acres just in Swanee County. People are buying from all over the world. At the clerk's office, we have deeds recorded. If you buy property, that's one of the things we do is record the deeds. And when you go through the pages and pages of indexes of the Swan River Land Belt Company, You'll see people from Australia, uh, Europe, just all over the world, literally, are buying up, usually sight unseen, this property. I'm not sure that was a smart move on their part, but they're buying from all over the world. So this uh, company that was established brought a lot of people into Suwannee County from all over the world. So that was Mr. Sears and his company. Now, tying into that Swanee River Railway uh, that we were talking about, uh, Swanee Springs and places like White Springs, that was a uh, tourism trap. Tourism trap, maybe? Tourism location, there we go. I like to call Swanee Springs and other places like that, Dowling Park and White Springs, the kind of the Disney World of the day. People would come, families would come from all over the world visiting places like Swanee Springs, and this was the second post-Civil War hotel at Swanee Springs. The first one was a much larger building that burned down in 1884 or 5, I believe, if memory serves, right after it was completed. So they built this second one, didn't want to put all their eggs in one basket, so they built a smaller a main hotel and lots of cabins. Some of those cabins still exist today. But they built these because Swanee Springs, even prior to the Civil War, back in the 1830s, we have records of Americans coming there to uh, enjoy the Sulphur Springs, to, to get healed from all kinds of ailments, or so they thought anyway. And so Swanee Springs is very popular in these early 1900 uh, years that we're looking at. But uh, they would actually go so far as to create Swanee Station, which was a couple miles away. Still exists, there's a name, because I live down that road. Uh, you drive by, there's a little sign that says Swanee Station. You blink and you're on the other side of it. Not much to it, but there used to be a railroad station there, and that's where the cars would come off the ACL, and, and they would go down, and I'll show you a picture in just a minute of it, but they would go down about two miles to the river uh, and to the resort. I mean, beautiful place, but as I said earlier, by the early 1900s, this era we're looking at, scientists are starting to realize the sulfur really is not doing much. It just stinks. <laughs> I guess stinking equal cleanliness back then, I don't know, or, or at least healing powers. So less and less people started to come. And then in 1908, the post office there closed. 
and that hotel burned shortly thereafter. So the annex to this second hotel, which is more or less where the kitchen and some other units were, became the third hotel, quote unquote. Most of the, camp, the people that were there were camping in the cabins or staying in the cabins. But just less and less people came. Several attempts were made to build it back up as a commercial uh, powerhouse. It just hasn't worked out. You can still you can go there today. It's recreational. But this was kind of what it looked like in the early 1900s. This is part of it anyway. This is the, the uh, spring house, as we call it, that was built of that coquina. And uh, you see several cubbies, I guess, better way to put them, I'm sure, uh, a cabana type thing, if you will. But that was over the spring, so you could go up there, you could change, you could sit and relax. You can sit up there and, I guess, sniff the sulfur that was floating up from the water. But you can go in there and you can swim, you can relax, those kinds of things. But, but that's kind of how it was. They had bowling pavilions, they had all kinds of stuff. You go hunting. I th believe one of the deputy sheriffs would actually take people out on guided hunting tours. So you'd go out and shoot whatever you wanted to. Um, there used to be a little steamboat. They had a small uh, boat, steamboat. I mean, not like a, st a steamship that we've been talking about, but just a little, you know, a launch, 20 footer or something like that, that they would then carry uh, passengers up and down the river just a little ways. So a lot of people would come here. A lot of people would come. This is a circa 1900 photo of actually Swanee Station. And so that's where you would stop. If you want to come by railroad to Swanee Springs, you would stop here at Swanee Station and you would get off the railroad here on the right and you'd go into the station, do your business, and then you'd get over here on this trolley which was pulled by either a horse or a mule, depending on the year, and you can barely see whichever animal it was right there. So it would be pulled down to the river, down to the resort. Now, I heard a story, a red story, years ago, where this building <coughs> burned down mysteriously, supposedly, and, and this is where you have to, you hear all kinds of things, and you read all kinds of things, and it may or may not be true, unless I say it, then it is true. But uh, supposedly a farmer got upset at the railroad company because the train had hit his animal, the cows, I believe. And so shortly thereafter, this building burned down. So maybe nothing to do with it, but I'm throwing it out there because that's something I've read in history books. But again, less and less people were starting to come there, so they didn't see the need to rebuild it. So... Swanee Springs, White Springs, there's other locations, even Dowling Park, which we'll talk about a little bit more in a minute. They're just not seeing the visitors that they were in the late 1800s and the first years of the 1900s. Meanwhile, other things are going on. Other buildings are being constructed. Uh, the African Baptist Church was established in 1868 at Live Oak. They met in a lot of different locations, including the Florida Institute, which became Florida Memorial College and is now Florida Memorial University. It started out in Live Oak if you did not know that. But that's where they were meeting, among other locations. But in 1908, this area we're looking at, they uh, purchased land on the corner of Walker and 7th Street. And in 1910, they completed this building here, which still stands today. It's a uh, natural hewn stone church building. It's uh, on the National Register, I believe, as a historic building, looking mainly like it, it did originally uh, as built. Other communities, Live Oak, I know, had a lot of stuff going on in it, but there were other communities going on at this time, including places like Falmouth. I have not been able to find, and nobody else, to my knowledge, has been able to find when Falmouth was actually established as a community. Lots of people live there. Uh, it does appear on maps of the late, eight, late 19th century, so the late 1800s. It was there, so we know it was there by then. Uh, the original name for it was not Falmouth. It was Peacock. It was Peacock. <laughs> And that's because there was a name, there was a Robert, Robert Peacock, who was a politician and businessman and such. Uh, he ran a mill, a sawmill and stuff in that area. So it was first named Peacock. And it was close to this springs, which we now call Falmouth Springs. Originally it was Newland Springs. And Newland was the name of uh, John Raleigh Newland, uh, was a politician and a businessman who lived in that area in the late 1800s. So originally Newland Springs, later became Falmouth. Well, how did it become founded? Well, by the late 1800s, it was a, a bustling, hustling community. 
had hundreds of people living by it, had uh, its own post office, it had a cotton gin, it had a sawmill, grist mill, those kinds of things. So it was one of those communities that had sprung up in the late 1800s. Well, uh, it was also a place that people liked to go hunting. And as the story goes, uh, there was a gentleman who had a bird dog named Falmouth, who he would take hunting with him. Well, one day this dog is accidentally killed, and so in 1906-ish, they renamed Peacock to Falmouth. Thought it might be a better name than Peacock, because most people didn't think of it as being Peacock, the name of the person. It was Peacock the animal. And I guess they got people wondering if we had peacocks around here. But anyway, they thought Falmouth was a much better name for it. Uh, there's actually a Falmouth in England. I remember several years ago, <coughs> 25 years ago, uh, the, I believe the mayor of Falmouth, England, came over and had his picture made, Falmouth here. Um, one of the books that came out about Swanee County's history shows a picture of him with some of the residents of that community, or the residents of that community. Well, Falmouth is like a lot of the other communities that we have been talking about over the years. As markets shifted, as better roads were built, people moved away, people moved to Live Oak, they moved maybe to Mass or other locations, Dowling Park even. And so Falmouth basically now is just, it used to say it had a country store and that was left, but even that's closed up now. And so basically it's just a few scattered homes, uh, those kinds of things. Uh, the old uh, church in Masonic Lodge burned down several years back. So. There's just not much left of found. There's found springs. You can still look at it. Let's see what else. Ah, this this era also sees something else in Swanee County's history, and that is the Swanee County Fair. This is a picture from the first year of the Swanee County Fair, Live Oak, Florida, November 10th, 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th. 1914, it says the only strictly agricultural fair in Florida. So that was a big deal at the time. Now, where was this fair held? Not where it is today. Uh, it was originally held just north of Duval Street in Live Oak. Um, best way to describe it would be where John Hill Park is today. It used to be called the Rec Center before they built the newer one. But that was property owned by the Dexter family, Horatio or Horace Dexter we've talked about I believe last month, because he had recently passed away. Well, his widow, Lizzie, still owned a lot of property, and so she rented the back of her property, basically, for the use of the fair. Her, her mansion, her huge home, was on the front side of that, uh, butting up against Duval Street. It was there for many decades, but she had plenty of property behind it, so she rented that out uh, for use by the fair. And it was there for several years. Then they would choose to move somewhere else. One of the locations going through the history books uh, and the newspaper articles, they moved over to where the Dixie Grill is today. That, they decided, let's go there. Then they moved back to the Dexter property. And then they moved over to the tobacco warehouses off Houston Street and, and Second Street. So they did that also. Getting reminders, sorry. And so they moved to different locations. It was not until well, in the 40s, 1942, 1945, there was no fair. Somebody tell me why. War. There we go, World War II. Can't have time for that kind of stuff. But they kept using mainly this Dexter property for the fair for over 40 years until 1956. They started doing it at the newly constructed Coliseum. And they bought additional property there in 1964, and that's where they've held it ever since. But 1914 was the first year. And I guess that girl is happy for the little penguin. <laughs> um, I don't know if you can read the, down there, but it says, pigs is pigs. <laughs> so I, yeah, they are. Sports. I talked about this, I believe, last month, but I'm going to mention it again. That Line Boat especially had a reputation as a good sports team. Now, we've had other years of that, too. I remember late 80s, early 90s with football. Uh, Coach Pittman, we were state champs four years in a row, those kinds of things as I was growing up. But it, it went way back even further to the 19-teens. In 1915, our baseball team was doing pretty well until they met with Palatka. And this is an article from the Palatka newspaper. Um, July 23rd edition, we were looked upon, Live Oaks baseball team was looked upon as, quote, uh, the finest aggregation of semi-professional ball tossers in Florida. And what happened was, despite that, we lost to Palatka for the first few games 
And so what Live Oak did was Live Oak went and uh, got some professional players from Charleston, South Carolina, and the Georgia State League, put them on as ringers, and we still lost <laughs> to Palatka. And Palatka, let's see, I don't know if you can see it in here. Uh, uh, right here, yeah. Thursday was another wet day, especially for Live Oak, where it is said that old got shot Potsdammer, as he read the telegraph bulletins from Palatka, wept a continuous stream of tears and refused to be comforted. He was a big baseball fan. We talked about him, uh, Gus Potsdammer. He was sheriff. Um, one of the most, I told you all last month, one of the most interesting people you'll read about in Swanee County's history. And I don't have time to get into him today, but he was an old man at this point, retired, and or removed by the governor from the sheriff's office. But uh, he was still enjoying his baseball. So, You've got changing markets. You've got people moving into the bigger towns. You've got the the loss of uh, Swanee Springs, these hotels, uh, because the sulfur is not the cure-all that people think it is. Uh, you've got other things going on, but that leads to some losses of other railroads, including the Florida Railway. We talked about, I believe, last month or the month before. And that railroad had been established by the Drew family, Governor Drew of Madison County, his sons established this when he kind of helped set it up before he passed away in 1900. But his son, Frank Drew, is the one that pretty much ran the Florida Railway. He was in charge of it for pretty much his whole life. His brother was more into the timber side of things. But the Florida Railway was a conglomeration of a couple of older railroads that had merged together, and it operated um, against the Live Oak, Perry and Gulf, LOPMG, and they were, they were in business competing against one another. And Frank Drew apparently had a habit of alienating people. And uh, he, he had what he wanted and, and he just stuck to it. And it caused trouble for the Florida Railway because uh, the SAL, Seymour Airline, uh, he was fighting a battle with them and the LOPMG for, for access to places like Lafayette County and elsewhere where there was still a lot of uncut timber. So he was trying to get in there. That's why his railroad went from Live Oak down to Wilmarth, which is between Waterville and Bramford, and trying to get into Lafayette County. So they were going back and forth, and he was pushing himself and overextending himself and his company. And uh, the negotiations were not going well between the SAL and him and LOPMG. Again, he was just alienating people. So by 1916, the Florida Railway is seeing a lot of lawsuits, uh, so much so that they are ordered to be sold uh, at a sale in Jacksonville. Well, Frank Drew still believes in this company. So he buys out the company for $35,000 of his own money back then. That's a million dollars today. And it had some money. So he, he spends a million dollars to try to save it, but it's just not enough. He even goes so far as to beg the SAL, Seward Airlines, to buy it out. Now, these guys have been fighting for years. A Seaboard Airline could have, and this is ironic to me, the Seaboard Airline could have bought this thing out and made a lot of money off of it. It would have been beneficial for them. But they hated Frank Drew so much, they said, eh, let him burn. So they did not help Frank Drew. They refused to do it. And by 1917, the railway had shut down. It was being torn up, not just by this scrapping car that you see here, but also some of its own employees were sabotaging the lines, tearing it up. It got so bad that Frank Drew and his wife couldn't even travel at night because they were in fear of their life because uh, that's how bad things had gone. So the Florida Railway ends. And pretty much at this point, really very little is left. The only real thing that's left is this railroad bridge at what used to be Wilmarth. Uh, again, halfway between Lurville and Brantford's the easiest way to describe it, on the river. And so this was the railroad bridge that went from Suwannee County into Lafayette County. And I think I talked about this bridge several months ago, that it's possible this, this came out in the 1870s and was moved here uh, circa 1900, 1905. Uh, there's a story that it actually came from Brazil. I don't know whether that's true or not, but the markings on it show uh, a manufacturer in New York, I believe it was, that only manufactured about a five or 10 year period, 1870s, maybe early 1880s. 
Uh, so it's a very old bridge, one way or the other, it's an old bridge. And we were still having steamboat traffic at this point, although the steamboats were more or less going away. We talked about those last month. There were very few, maybe one or two steamboats at this time traveling up and down the river. So that's why it's a turning bridge, one of several we had in Suwannee County. Well, when the railway shut down, they just turned it up and down river so many steamboats could still go past it. They didn't have somebody that was going to sit there and pay attention and turn it back and forth every time. They just said, hey, let's just turn it up and down river and leave it for good. Well, that's fine and dandy. That allowed it to survive. And over the years, as you go through the county commission minutes, you will find that Swain and Lafayette counties up through the 30s, mid-30s and the 40s, were looking at repurposing this bridge as a road to basically make a road between Swanee County and Lafayette County. But obviously, nothing happened with it, and it still sits there today. Now, I've never done it myself, but I've heard there's some good fishing there at the base of that pillar. Um, but I mean, I, I took this picture, I was probably about 15 years ago now. There's a boat ramp right there where I'm standing, just downriver from the bridge over Lafayette County. So, the end of the Florida Railway helps out somebody else, and that is the LOPNG, Live Oak Period and Gulf. So now they don't have that competitor, that local competitor. And so they are getting more in that. Is that your, your grandmother? I think the one on the left is my grandmother. That's the engine, the 100, 101. Is it, my dad was a conductor on the railroad, and that's, I was two blocks, born two blocks, and that can hear it at night. And what's her name? Uh, now, now watch worse. No, 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 watch worse. Okay. Senior's wife. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, hey. that's, that's cool. I don't have a name on there, unfortunately. But, yeah. I had to ride that as a kid. My daddy put me up in Clarence Wright at the old fireman club. We put me up, let me ring the bell. The water <laughs> tank was uh, <laughs> 500 yards back behind that. Now, this was taken in live book, you think? Uh, I would, I, I guess, I don't know if that's, uh, look like the shed that's put it in like the sheds, yeah. yeah. It appears to be. But yeah, that, the demise of the Florida Railway gave that a boost for sure. More passengers, more cargo, more people standing in front of them to take pictures. I just believe it's her because of like the hat and, his, and a purse that was her, uh, uh, she wore all, she had to have a hat, had to have gloves and a purse. <laughs> And she would know the right people to be able to get pictures. I mean, hey, that 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 sounds as good as anything I've heard. Actually, better than what I've heard. So uh, that's good. Yeah, but I mean, it definitely helped them. And this is the map I showed you at the beginning of the presentation. Uh, but notice here. So this is the L O P N G, and this is the Florida Railway. Right here is Wilmar. So it came down to Mayo, shot over Louisville. So this one is shut down, abandoned, ripped up by 1917-1918. So that map shows the rail, the rail road, excuse me, in and around Swanee County. So we still had a good bit, besides the SAL and the, the ACL. Several of them. It's even showing uh, what looks like, I don't know, I don't know. Lots of different ones on there. So as we get to 1916, 1917, we've got something, a little thing going on around the world called World War I, which wasn't called World War I at the time because they didn't know there was going to be a second World War. But um, uh, the war to end all wars, different names that it was called. But it began in 1914. Well, the United States was not really involved in it to begin with. We tried to be neutral, just like we did in World War II. Um, we carried on conversations with all the, the belligerents. We had people steaming on steamers. 1915, the Lusitania is sunk. We have, I think, 127 Americans are killed. Uh, we've got several other things going on. We've got, um, I just forgot the name of the telegram. That went to Zimmerman, Zimmerman telegram to Mexico from Germany saying basically if you join our side, we'll let you have part of the United States. Lots of things are going on that are building up uh, some hostility against Germany and its allies uh, from the United States. And so in 1917, uh, our National Guard unit is basically, it's reformed. It's organized as the Florida National Guard. Before that, it was called the militia and a few other things, the state troops, things like that. But they were 
preparing for war because they saw that, you know what, something's going to be happening eventually. And so we become part of the Florida National Guard, and we are called Company E, 1st Regiment of Infantry. And this was its first commander as a National Guard unit, and that is uh, Captain Joe Heinley. And as it would turn out later in that year, 1917, we entered World War One, and our troops report to Camp Wheeler up in Georgia uh, before they go off to Europe to fight. Now, Joe Heinley, lots of different things, businessman and whatnot. He actually, in 1934, was appointed sheriff of Swanee County after W.H. Lyle, who had been sheriff for like 20 years. He passed away unexpectedly. So this guy uh, became the sheriff in the mid-1930s. So as the United States enters World War I in 1917, uh, we have troops that are being called up from all over the country. Uh, many of Swanee County citizens answer that call, and they come up. I don't have a list in front of me because there were so many of them. Same thing World War II. There were many people that were patriotic and joined the war. Now, when you look at old Swanee Democrats especially, you see that, that things change as soon as we enter the war. Lots of articles about uh, call-ups of not only the National Guard, but uh, of the active military, of people being called in. You've got to have quotas. You know, this county's got to have so many men that are, are entering the service and such. You've got military boards being talked about. You've got liberty bonds, war bonds being talked about. And then they start talking about faraway places in Europe, especially France, it seems to be mainly, uh, talking about the war that was happening, there, battles that were happening there, places that most Americans had never heard of. And to be honest, most Americans today probably couldn't tell you they've known of either. Uh, lots of battles are happening, some of which start to involve American troops. Uh, one thing that does happen in August of 1917 is Live Oak's own mayor, Joe Lamb, he actually resigns to go back into the Army as a colonel. And so uh, even our politicians are getting involved. Even big wig politicians, like the mayor, are getting involved and doing their civic duty. The newspaper articles talk about the sheriff, Sheriff Lyle at this point still. Uh, he is helping to get Swanee County's quota of eligible men to serve. Uh, there's one, one of the articles talks about him rounding up slackers. And, quote, some are trying all the tricks in the book, but the sheriff is equal to the occasion. So he's not taking a lot of excuses. He's trying to get the folks uh, to join the war. In 1918, we read in the April, one of the April newspapers, of a war train coming through, one similar to this, carrying relics of the war, things that have been captured by the German, from the Germans, and some of our own stuff. That stayed in Live Oak for a few hours. Let people come and look like these kids are, uh, these folks. Uh, you know, come see what we've captured from the enemy, you know, the Huns, the terrible Huns, uh, and others. And also, that was a time to hear rousing speeches from government officials. Federal government, state government, local government, basically trying to get people, more people to join the war effort. So that's going on. So lots of different things in the newspapers, um, talking about the war, talking about people that have left, you know, occasional injuries, casualties, those kinds of things. It's not as bad for Swanee County as it is in World War II, because a lot of our troops get involved kind of late in the war. So that's a good thing, I guess, for casualties for here. But again, they're talking about different battles. They're talking about, you know, American troops were in the X battle and Y battle and capture so many Germans or, or whoever else they were fighting at the time, mainly Germans. But you've got that going on. Meanwhile, we're starting to kind of curb our uh, usage of things and, and kind of being on the lookout. And one of the kind of, it's, I guess it's funny now, looking back. But in 1918, September of 1918, the Atlantic Coast Line Railroad Bridge over the Swain River, which was just west of Swain River State Park, I mean, uh, Swain, Spirit of the Swain just west of that, just north of Swanee Station, burned down. And so the Swanee Democrats looking at it say, you know, it might have been, it just might have happened, but we think it's saboteurs. We think there's some groups out there that are trying to, to destroy our, our infrastructure because, yeah, that, that railroad was carrying troops and military supplies, so, so we think it might be sabotage. So people are paranoid. It didn't seem like it was. There, there was no records showing sabotage. It probably just burned down. It happens. It's happened before. Truth was a lot more mundane, but, but you see that kind of paranoia popping up that there might be German spies out there. And we see it again in World War II. Uh, but this railroad bridge burning is kind of 
interesting because there's a whole, whole little part of the article talking about it. It's wartime. We're on a wartime footing at this point. But of course, 1918, the war ends, November 11th, the war, you know, end all wars and Armistice Day. And we carry on with our lives. Meanwhile, other things are going on, other communities are going on. Places like Bramford. By the early 1900s, Bramford had several sawmills. Uh, they had several cotton gins. They had a cold storage plant. They had a bank. They had a newspaper. They had a board of trade, which is kind of like the Chamber of Commerce. Um, they were a center for farming and for livestock, things like that. So this picture shows kind of the end of our era that we're talking about today. Uh, the Stalby Hotel, which was a, a nice place to go. People would stop there from all over the state at least, and in parts of the country as they travel. See those nice vehicles in front? <clears throat> Free air conditioning. Bramford State Bank, which was Bramford's first bank, was organized during this era, 1911. Uh, S.M. Martin, John J. Dipsy, H.J. Heath, M.A. Best, and A. Lee Humphreys were the charter members. These were big wigs, especially in Bramford. It had a capital of $15,000, and Fred Phillips was the cashier. So that family still is around today down in Brantford. Now, Brantford at this time also renews its town charter in 1915. Uh, just there were some issues with it. It's time to update it. So they renew it in 1915. They continue to grow. Um, this photograph is actually the Brantford State Bank on opening day in 1911. Now, the story goes, and this is, again, one of those... I don't know if it's true or not, but I'm going to pass it on to you with a caution. But as the story goes, part of this portion down here is actually, if you've been to the museum, our museum in town, uh, you will see what appears to be that base there today. So the uh, part of that cashier's area there is now the Swain County Historical Museum. And I'm chairman of that, so I see it a lot. I mean, if it's not it, it's very similar to it. But that's as the story goes. And again, take it as you will. Downing Park, y'all might have heard of that community. <laughs> Downing Park first called Hudson upon the Swanee. We talked about it over the last few months. Uh, in the early 1900s, it is renamed Downing Park or Dowling's Park, depending on who you talk to, because of the Dowling contribution. Being able to bring in uh, lots of of people in, especially with sawmills, hundreds of workers in this area. And so they realize, you know what, you've basically rebounded our, our community, you've brought lots of commerce, lots of people, so we're going to name it in your family's honor. So it becomes very prominent in the late 1800s and early 1900s. By 1910, Dolly Park had several stores, it had its own hotel, it had a railroad depot, it had the lumber company, the Dowling Lumber Company's administrator building. There were 73 tenant houses for some of the railroad workers and the, the uh, sawmill workers especially. Lots of homes like these that were along the river from some of the prominent families, some of them being Dallas. Directly across on the other side was the Park Hotel. Park Hotel had two swimming pools, it had a bowling alley, it had landscape grounds, and people just like Swanee Springs visited from all around the world. So it was very thriving in this, the beginning of part of this era anyway. That's a picture of the Park Hotel, part of the, the uh, Downing Park area. Let's see what I've got on that. Yeah, again, a, a resort town. Swanee Springs, Downing Park, White Springs, these were all resort communities in Florida and, and mainly Swanee County. This is from a 1904 Swanee Democrat. It's an article that I've got at the clerk's office, probably because there were tax deeds being sold that year, and they got lazy, and instead of just cutting out the tax deeds, they just kept the whole newspaper. Yay for me, as a historian. But this talks about Dowling's White Sulphur Park, one of the many advertisements you see, not just locally, but also around the country. Talking about it being an ideal spot. One of the most beautiful parks to be found anywhere in Florida. Um, the river makes a great circle. Talks about cliffs of rocks. You'll find the finest sulfur water in the state of Florida. 
You're going to find a fine bathing pool filled with this sparkling sulfur water. Nice and smelly. They didn't put that there for some reason. Find a good hotel. You can get first class meals at any time. Uh, also, a number of beautiful cottages, which can be rented for $4 per week. Nicely furnished. Uh, things have changed. Bowling alleys. Nicely arranged pavilions. Ladies and gentlemen both can enjoy themselves there. Refreshments served at all times. No mosquitoes. That was a big selling point. No mosquitoes at the Park Hotel. You can get here from Live Oak for 50 cents on the railroad. And then there's several other places that no longer exist. Star, Mercer, Platt, Lancaster. It's a cheap ride from Live Oak down to the park. Um, I have another article, I believe, one of the, the, the things going for the park hotels that had running hot and cold water. So that hot water was a big deal back then. Have it running for you instead of having to go heat it up yourself. So, you know, interesting stuff. But again, that fell victim to this idea, this, this realization that the sulfur water really doesn't do much for you. So people stopped coming. But in the meantime, Thomas Dowling, we talked about a couple months ago, he passed away in 1911. Well, shortly before he died, he gave 400 acres uh, to the Dowling Park area to be used as an Advent Christian campground. That idea didn't really take off at that point. And so that the property kind of sat unused. But in 1912, Burr Bixler, who was a minister of the Adam Christian Church uh, in Suwannee County, he asked to use it to house orphans. Of course, the rest is history here. Uh, this area would not exist. We would not be in here that this building. You probably would not be here if it weren't for the Adam Christian Village. That was established in 1914. Um, 1914, correct? That's right. 13. Like 1914 is my kid's school, sorry. 1913. So it starts. First kids receive the in 1913. First retirees, 1914. Um, by the end of this era, we're looking at by 1919, 50 children and 12 retirees uh, are living here at the village. Uh, this is a picture of some of the first orphans. They're on the banks of the Suwannee River. This picture is from 1916. So even though Dowling Park as a community overall is starting to decline because the sulfur hotel, you know, the, the sulfur springs aren't as good as people thought they were, you've got the Adam Christian Village coming in to take its place and doing a whole lot better, to be honest, than some of these other things we'll be doing. So it makes Dowling Park what it is today. Welburn, another community that is starting to grow at this time, early 1900s, late 1800s. Its first bank, the Welburn Bank, was opened in 1910, $15,000 capital. E.B. McLaren Sr. was the president, and he was the guy that built this house and lived in this house. Uh, this was built in 1909, just before he helped establish that bank. That house is still there. Last I saw, it was being used as a bed and breakfast in Welburn, so uh, that helps that community to grow also. But again, as things change as better transportation comes around you've got less and less communities and i've talked about it already i've shown you this map but places like clayland pine mount ricksford wilmark wilson start disappearing in this era it's just they might be on the map but there's really nothing there but a few scattered homes school system in swanee county is expanding modernizing there are still many, many schools out and about uh, these communities. Not just Live Oak, not just Brantford, but all over the place. Less than there used to be, but there's still a lot. But this school, sometimes called the Partially School, was built or completed in 1916, and it served for the next, I don't know, six decades or so uh, as a school. First as a high school, later on as a junior high, and some other, other things, but the Partially School. This photo was taken circa 1922. There's a lot of photographs that were used for postcards from 1922. This is one of them uh, for this building. The courthouse, the post office, lots of downtown buildings. So 1922. And if I recall, my aunt fell down the stairs as a kid right there. So I've heard that story more than once. <laughs> there was 
three stories. Yeah, with that partial boiler, that boiler room still to the bottom. I went through there, seventh grade, or no, uh, the fourth grade is where I was transferred over from Eddie Bates to the boiler room. Yeah. Then across the street to the high school. To the high school, Bill Metcalf, yeah. The lunch room was in the cafeteria. You went through that door there and downstairs to eat lunch. Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember that building being there when I was growing up. It was abandoned. It was it was not in use. But it's only been what twenty years since they tore it down. Twenty five years maybe. So it was there for a long time. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, across the street, first bed. This was on the north side of it. Yeah, the north side. Yeah, this is pretty much about where the uh, what, uh, family life building is. Family ministry, family ministry building. Yeah. Pretty much that's where it was. Well, because they built this new Swanee school, there no longer was a need for this school, which had been the old Swanee school, Swanee High School. And this building had been built in 1889. They added to it uh, years later. But this building uh, was sold to Florida, the Florida Institute in 1916. Uh, this is a picture prior to that showing a lot of the white kids well, 1916, they sold it, uh, and it was moved to the Florida Memorial Institute's uh, campus, which was, what, two blocks to the west? And it was used as dormitories. <laughs> and this is a picture of it being used apparently as such because these are students of Florida Memorial College. So that's showing the building, looking a little older. Uh, I wish the photograph was better. I'm not sure when it was taken, but it shows that school. And as we're talking about Florida Memorial, or Florida Institute or Florida Memorial Institute, in 1918 it became Florida Memorial College. It added two-year programs and became a college. Later became a university. Uh, but at this point it's Florida Institute and it becomes Florida Memorial College, still in Live Oak for a few more decades anyway. But that shows a lot of their students there, presumably early 1900s, best I, I can gather. The photograph almost looks older than that, but who knows? Cotton, cotton. Cotton since the Civil War has become a major, major cash crop in Suwannee County. And it is during this era as well. The early 1900s, depending on who you listen to or who you read, Swanee County is producing either 10% of the world supply or 10% of the United States supply. I'll go with probably United States supply, which is still a whole heck of a lot. 10% of, of this, this uh, sea island cotton. Very fine, short staple cotton. Good stuff. Well, problem is, in this era we're looking at, before 1920, there is something called the boll weevil that gets into it. And wipes out our crop. And as you go through the old newspaper articles, you start reading things. I actually wrote an article on it in, in uh, 2017, but, but basically by 1915, looking at those articles, you see this white Democrat reporting, hey, um, uh, there's this bull weevil that's up in Georgia that might be a little bit of a, a concern, that, that maybe it'll get down here, maybe not, maybe not. Uh, then there's starting to be quarantines of different counties, especially their cotton crops, in Georgia, in South Georgia. Then there's a 1915 uh, September article. Let me quote this. It's an understatement, by the way. It says, quote, they, which is the state and federal authorities, said there was no cause for panic, but that every grower should make plans to reduce acreage as soon as the weevil appears. No cause for concern, but you might want to, you know, not plant as much, pretty much. So it starts spreading. By 1917, the bull weevil is coming to Swanee County. So the newspaper articles are coming out. There's more and more talking about it. July or June 1917, uh, talking about trying to catch them by using a light at night to attract them. One citizen recommended burning stumps around the cotton fields at night. Uh, let's see. Yeah, the Democrat says, quote, this method may not get all of them, but the experiment is worth trying. So there were lots of bonfires, I'm sure, going around Swanee County in 1917. But it was not enough. So by May of 1918, uh, there's a farmer that's actually coming to the Democrat and showing how many bull eagles 
he is caught. Um, quote, it goes to prove that the little pest has begun to get in his work early and will all probability destroy the biggest part of the crop in this section. Now that same farmer, that cotton farmer, when he came into the Democrats said, you know what, I'm done with cotton, I'm going to plant Spanish peanuts instead. I know those are a plenty making crop, and uh, man and beast alike can eat them. So I'm going to stop this cotton nonsense and lose my crop. There's another guy that comes in the next month that had caught a thousand of them real quickly, baited them with some flour sacks. Uh, he had some, some way of doing it. And the guy's name was a Mr. Walker. I don't have a first name, but he was from the McAlpin area. But the Democrat pointed out, uh, quote, if his method worked out on a larger scale, cotton fields can be entirely clean of the weevil in a few nights and at trifling expenditure of money. Unfortunately, the Democrat did not say how the guy did it, and it doesn't look like it worked anyway. So, it destroyed the cotton crop. Just wiped out a lot of fortunes. A lot of people decided to start moving out of Swanee County at this point. They've been making their money in cotton. Well, the ones that were left, the farmers that were left, were trying to find a crop that would replace cotton. And so in 1917, you've got A.D. Gaskins and W.H. Lyle, who again was the sheriff at the time. He uh, goes up into the Carolinas and they bring back bright leaf blue tobacco and start bringing folks from the Carolinas to start uh, planting it, learning how to crop it. And so that becomes the new cash crop in Swanee County for many decades. In lots of decades, that was the cash crop here in Swanee County. Until the little thing called, you know, cancer and stuff came up. That put a little bit of a dent in it, don't you think? But it was the cash crop from the late 19, the 1917, 18 era, 20s, the 30s, about through the, what, 60s probably. So that replaces, to an extent, cotton. Not near as healthy for you. Anyway, so other things going on, Carrie Hardy. Carrie Hardy, born in 1876 over in Taylor County. In 1900, he moves to Swanee County and opens up a law firm. He also dabbles in a lot of different businesses. In 1915, he is elected to the Florida House of Representatives. Uh, he actually serves, at the time it was unprecedented, as two years as Speaker of the House, very shortly thereafter. So uh, still rather young, serving Speaker of the House. In 1920, he is elected governor of the state of Florida. We'll talk about it more next month. But he becomes governor. Uh, anybody heard of Hardy County? There we go. That's why there's a Hardy County. But yeah, we'll talk more about him next month, and the next few months after that, to be honest. Because he dabbles in so many different businesses, banks and whatnot. So as we come to the end of this 20-year era that we talked about in the last three months, we show a map of Swanee County in 1920. You see, uh, in some ways, it's actually showing more communities. But to be honest, most of these communities are just a name on the map. There, there's really nothing there. Uh, some homesteads, maybe a little country store, not much there. Uh, even some of the railroads that are shown on here are gone. The Florida Railway by 1920, it really no longer exists. It's been torn up. It's been out of use for several years. But it's still showing up on the old map. And again, most of these communities are just communities in name only. So that's the end of this. Next month, Lord willing, we will get into the 1920s. So, any questions, thoughts, comments? Nothing? Y'all wait? I don't have a light stop, sorry. <laughs> it was a great presentation. Thank you. Yeah. Lights are bright now. <laughs> it's getting dark. Well, thank you. Well. I think next time I do this, I keep adding stuff into the presentations. I'm like, well, I've already gone through those years, but let me throw it in this one just to talk about. Next time I think I'm going to recombine these three and put them on a chronological order because I was hitting stuff from 1900 to 1920 today, but I wanted to get the stuff in. I thought you might want to know it. I wanted to know it. I figured I would too. So. Hopefully there's some good information. Yes, sir. Is there any way to catch up with where you are in the earlier ones? Yes, you can go to the uh, uh, YouTube and the library. The regional library has them video. Great, thank you. So this was, I think, number 14, mm -hmm. I think. Uh, where's the... 
yeah, number 14. So yeah, the previous 13 are already posted or should be soon. All of them, but maybe last month should be posted already. So just just do a search for the Swine River Regional Library. Great, thank you so much. Thank you all again. Anything else? Thank you, Gary. All right, well, good to see y'all again. Lord willing, see y'all next month.